my privilege to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Dan Flores. He's an American writer and historian who specializes in cultural and environmental studies of the American West. Um, I will tell you his book, American Serengeti, The Last Big Animals of the Great Plains, has a marvelous chapter on the bison, and I recommend his entire book to you, um, but certainly to that chapter for our topic today. His role today is to get us thinking about why the buffalo still matters to all of us as Americans. We are honored to have such an eminent scholar to get us thinking about that. He could not be here in person with us today, but he is joining us from his home in New Mexico. Please welcome Professor Flores. Thank you, Dr. Stilgan. Let me make sure everybody can uh, hear me. So I apologize to you for not being able to uh, be there in person. Um, uh, without going into a lengthy description, I'll simply say that it has to do with uh, uh, COVID, the sort of thing that we're all, all confronting. Uh, and uh, uh, I've had it once. <laughs> I'm uh, not eager to have it again and I'm about to, to uh, go on a, a nearly three week long um, overseas. So uh, I'm trying to be really careful here in the few days before leaving. So uh, that doesn't uh, alter, however, my sense that this bison symposium is a really important uh, conference to be having about our national mammal. So without any further ado, and so we have some time at the end of what I have to say for questions, if you have any, uh, I'll, I'll just proceed into, uh, into my story, Why the Buffalo Matt. Uh, Dr. Scogan held up that book, American Serengeti of mine, and uh, I'll tell you a couple of, of stories out of that particular book. And in fact, the one that I start with uh, comes out of American Serengeti. In the summer of 1843, four years after completing his epic Birds of America, John James Audubon was traveling up the Missouri River for an ambitious new project. Audubon had just done a book tour of Europe dressed in buckskins, his hair cascading about his shoulders. Now he and his sons, Victor and John Woodhouse, were deep into work to portray America's mammals. Because the genius behind the bird book had been intimate first-hand observation of his subjects in nature, Audubon knew he could not produce a grand book on mammals with paintings done from specimens. So it was authenticity that brought one of the world's premier nature artists to the Great Plains aboard the steam vessel Omega. Here was a man who had spent almost his entire life in the wilds of America observing nature, contemplating its moods, beauty, and meaning. He had read the great books on the West, including Lewis and Clark's account from three decades before and fellow artist George Catlin's more recent volumes. Yet Audubon was in no way prepared for what unfolded in front of them as the Omega made its way past the ruins of the Mandan and a ripper of villages destroyed by smallpox six years earlier, bound for Fort Union at the confluence of the Yellowstone and the Missouri. It was the animals that stunned him. Watching the country unwind in front of them from the prow of their vessel, to Audubon, the plains almost seemed to vibrate with life. There were so many animals of so many different kinds that the renowned artist could not believe what he was seeing. In one stretch, two weeks downstream from Fort Union, as they approached the western border of today's North Dakota, Audubon witnessed a 10,000-year-old American Eden. Bighorn rams peered down on them from the river bluffs, Grizzly bears prowl the banks, wolves stretched out on the sandbars watching them like dogs, elk swam the river on all sides of their craft, and buffalo loped along the banks in a handsome, picturesque canter. It was impossible, he wrote in the journal he kept of the trip, to describe or even conceive the vast multitude 
multitudes of these animals that exist even now and feed on these ocean-like prairies. As he wrote his wife, Lucy, his mind was swimming with excitement. So I want to pause for just a second and make sure that I'm getting you uh, the best feed. Let's see if that works a little better. Okay. None of these ancient American creatures impressed Audubon so much as the icon of the plains, the bison. Because he set his feelings to words, we know something about how his experience among the vast herds affected him. One of his primary memories of the West was auditory. Wolves howling and bulls roaring, just like the long continued roll of a hundred drums. Thousands upon thousands of buffaloes. The roaring can be heard for miles. But there was pathos in that memory. As a young man, Audubon once described himself as a two-legged monster with a gun. But he was 58 now and had long since soured on watching animals die. Americans in the West were murdering, his word, those thousands upon thousands of bison in senseless play. What a terrible destruction of life as, it were for, as if it were for nothing or next to it, he wrote. Senseless destruction is America's historical memory of the animal that has now become our sole national mammal. To honor the creature that once stood as wilderness symbol of America for much of the world, on April the 28th, 2016, President Barack Obama signed into law the National Bison Legacy Act which joined the American bison with the bald eagle as celebrated wildlife symbols of our nation. As with our national bird, also rescued from near oblivion when economic interest and outright cluelessness nearly destroyed it, making the bison our national mammal means that its historical story trails it through time like a tail to a kite. So why does the buffalo matter enough to make it the mammalian symbol of the United States? I think the answer is that such a designation ensures that its story stands as the best known set piece of our country's environmental history. As the remarkably abundant icon of the Native America that Old Worlders found here five centuries ago, the buffalo remains the most visible wildlife to plunge from unbelieved richness to outright loss or near loss with last second rescue. For Americans who are thoughtful about who we are and the kind of country we ought to have, the buffalo's fate is one of the stories like climate change in our time, we really ought to understand and internalize as part of our historical trajectory. The Ottoman story about Buffalo was really a penultimate end game account. What had Audubon in a state of euphoria was getting to see within only half a century of its entire disappearance, the American version of Africa's Serengeti Plain. For 10,000 years following the end of the Pleistocene, evolution and native people had preserved the American Great Plains as one of the natural spectacles of the world, equaled only by places like the Serengeti or the Maasai Mara. Even the landscapes were similar, immense open grasslands extending to the curve of the earth. But it wasn't just the setting the rhythmic intersection of horizontal plains with distant pyramidal mountains visible on the horizon across vast opalescent distances. What drove 19th century travelers like Audubon or Lewis and Clark to prairie fever euphoria was the presence of so much sheer life. 
that marvelous aggregation of big grazers and their predators all bathed in the clear light of the West. From observers like them, and even earlier chroniclers such as Pedro Castaneda of the Coronado Entrada of the 1500s, and Castaneda said of bison that they had manes like lions, carried their tails over their backs like scorpions, and were as numerous as the fishes in the sea. From these accounts, we actually get only the two minutes before midnight version of this story. Bison, in fact, were part of the grand bestiary that began assembling on this continent as far back as 66 million years ago, following the great Chicxulub impact that set off Earth's fifth extinction. However, the truth was with respect to that bestiary, offered up to us primarily through new genomic science, is that like humans, bison were relative latecomers to America. Animals like horses and camels, which we hardly regard as part of our wildlife inheritance, are far more ancient natives, extending back many millions of years. So are our bears, our big cats, and our canids. In the case of bison, genetic and fossil evidence now suggests the first of them got to North America from Asia no earlier than 300,000 years ago, and possibly as recently as 130,000 years ago. Bison, in fact, may have beat humans here only by 100,000 years. While the African grasslands retain their Pleistocene megafauna into our own time, in North America we lost our elephants, most of our giant cats, our ground sloths, even our horses and camels. In 2018, a National Academy of Sciences study described the effect as predatory humans spread out of Africa and around the world. The loss of 300 mammal species and a large number of flightless birds. Two billion years of unique evolutionary history vanished in what the authors described as close to a worst case scenario of genetic loss. I argue in my forthcoming book, Wild New World, that this in fact is what launched our present sixth extinction. With a third of the planet's 27,000 vertebrate species presently in decline, and a quarter of them possibly facing extinction. Unlike the fifth, this sixth extinction is slow motion, spooling out across the last 50,000 years. Well, we may have lost mammoths and horses, there were survivors, and prominent among them was the bison. By seven or 8,000 years ago, evolution and human selection pressures we're remaking the West into the historic version we're familiar with now. Until our modern world destroyed it in another series of genetic losses, this one robbing the planet of a half million more years of evolved genetics, there was this modern version of the Serengeti, one that native people helped shape and preserve. This version featured a rich ecosystem Bison playing the role of wildebeests, pronghorns functioning ecologically like antelopes and gazelles, gray and red wolves filling the niche of wild dogs, and coyotes doing an exact impression of jackals. And eventually, when old worlders return them to America, wild horses playing the role of bands of zebras. Africa might have retained its lions, but the historic American Serengeti had another king of beasts, the grizzly, which played a godlike role on the prairies. And of course, there were the native people whose hunting pressures and religious traditions shaped this world, pushing bison to evolve into a smaller form whose quick reproductive turnover and relative lack of grazing competition allowed them to increase into vast millions that had virtually no counterpart anywhere else on Earth, even in Africa.
Those native religions feature a critical insight, very likely a very ancient human insight about ourselves and the diverse life around us, namely that we are them and they are us. That understanding of kinship between humanity and the rest of the planet's living world was not something old worlders would rediscover until Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species. And that book appeared a mere 163 years, only two stacked human lifetimes ago. The part of the buffalo story that National Mammal Designation can't ignore is that end game John James Audubon glimpsed. Other speakers are going to cover this, so of this part of the story, I will say only that the reality of the buffalo's 19th century end game was that it is exhibit A in the horrific history of wildlife slaughter in America a destruction so wide-ranging across so many species as to have no counterpart anywhere else in world history. This was one of our country's most shameful episodes, and the bison is our entree to it. Not merely millions of them, but millions of pronghorns, of elk, of wild horses, of bighorn sheep, grizzlies and black bears, red and gray and eastern wolves, jaguars, cougars, beavers, fur seals, sea otters, along with entire bird species, great auks, Carolina parakeets, snowy egrets, trumpeter swans, whooping cranes, California condors, heath hens, ivory-billed woodpeckers, and the most numerous single bird species on earth, the passenger pigeon, vanished or almost did, from the American landscape. Amazingly, 60 million white-tailed deer plummeted to barely 300,000 animals by the early 1900s. And many of these creatures vanished, or nearly so, across the span of only two centuries. Somehow the bison tail accepted, this is a story that has done a disappearing act of its own, as it's almost invisible in American historical memory. But the United States' unwillingness or inability to curtail this slaughter makes up one of the most significant failures of public will in our history. Only our last half century of frantic rescues, including of our national bird, the bald eagle, partially absolves this guilt. I will offer that the bison's last second rescue is instructive about the ideology behind why we let this happen. Why did the country look away from an ecological wipeout this widespread and profound? Beyond the simple imperative of making money off wild creatures, and that was an objective of market capitalism from the moment colonizing old worlders beheld the continent's wild riches, Americans a century ago sought to create the United States as a clone of Europe, a part of Earth where almost no big wild animals had remained for centuries. Bison, along with wolves, jaguars, grizzlies, even flocks of passenger pigeons, were deemed just too wild to remain in a country made in the image of Britain or France. This ideology is transparent in a famous American image that most of you know, the Brooklyn painter John Gass' 1872 American Progress, portraying a blonde giant in angelic white striding across the West, stringing telegraph wires behind her, while in her wake, colonizing settlers take over the country. and disappearing off the edges of the canvas, herds of buffalo, packs of gray wolves, and native people, of course, all of them too wild for America's future. So it should not surprise any of us that when we did rescue those last remaining bison, 
Our plan was to keep them in parks and refuges, apparently so that 20th century Americans and tourists from around the world could gawk for a few minutes before turning away to their watches or their phones. A century ago, when bison were rescued from oblivion, we seemed to think of the wild creature whose massive herds had symbolized America as just now another consumer trope of Old West nostalgia. Little different, really, from roadside rattlesnake pits or wall drug billboards shouting at you about the amazing, the amazing sights that you just missed. So I'll leave you with this story, and this is another story that I tell in American Serengeti. Uh, in fact, it's the conclusion of that Buffalo chapter uh, that Dr. Skogan mentioned uh, in the introduction. One evening in the 1990s, I had dinner with Fred Dubray of the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. A rancher and a Vietnam vet, Fred is one of the founders of an organization now known as the Inter-Tribal Buffalo Council. Over our meal, Fred told me this story. When he and other visionaries, he said, had the idea of recovering buffalo in Indian country, a Lakota woman elder had taken them by the arm and said, in effect, Fred, best you ask the buffalo if they want to come back. I found myself holding my breath while Fred proceeded to take a couple of bites, sipped his drink, dabbed the corner of his mouth with a napkin. You can imagine uh, the anxiousness with which I awaited the rest of this story. And so I finally got out. So what happened, Fred? Well, he replied, we did a ceremony and we asked them. And what did the buffalo say? There was another lengthy pause. Finally, Fred looked up from his meal, locked eyes with me and said this. They said they did want to come back, but they said they didn't want to come back and be cows. They said they wanted to be buffalo. They said they wanted to be wild again. And I think in the buffalo's future, that's our task now, to help them become wild in America once more. Thank you for listening to this. I much appreciate it. Wow, Dr. Flores, you have certainly given us a lot to think about. You have no idea how you've touched on topics that we're going to be digging much more deeply into over the next couple of days. And I know you didn't get to hear uh, Lakota Elder uh, Eagle's uh, discussion with us, but he related the same thing about the religions that you brought up, about the connectivity. And it was, it's just, you know, you've you've... Mr. Eagle confirmed exactly what your argument is as well. So, but you've given us so much to think about. Now, we've got a few minutes here uh, before we're going to go into a break, and I want to give folks a uh, chance to ask questions. Now, we've got um, Sarah is up here with a microphone. You can't just yell the question. You've got to use the microphone so Dr. Flores can hear you. Or there is a, a microphone down here if you uh, feel like you want to walk down the steps here. But otherwise, Sarah's up here, and she's going to uh, help us. Are there any questions? Ah, here's, there's a question down here. I think she's almost there. Hey Dan, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, 
My question boils down to your last comment about Buffalo coming back and wanting to be wild and the idea of the American Prairie um, and uh, historic bison range as wild country. This is a little bit of a trick question, but what is your what are your thoughts on what it means for Buffalo to be wild today? Well, I would I would start a response by saying that uh, there's a there's kind of a context here. Uh, if you think about so many of the other animals uh, of the West of that American Serengeti that I uh, evoke that uh, we did allow to be wild. Uh, we allowed elk uh, and bighorn sheep uh, and mule deer uh, and white tails, moose, uh, grizzly bears, uh, black bears. I mean, the list goes on and on to be wild animals. Uh, it does raise an interesting question about why a century ago, uh, the people who rescued uh, bison and uh, attempted to preserve their legacy in America determined that this would not be the future for, for this particular animal. Uh, and I would sort of pose that against the experience of uh, so many of the African countries that uh, at least uh, by referring to the Serengeti and the Maasai Mara, I uh, attempted to reference uh, Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, where large game parks became a feature of the open country there. And so there's part of the story uh, that uh, informs this response has to do with America's uh, image of the future for the Great Plains uh, as opposed to many of the other areas of the West, the Rocky Mountains, for example, the Great Basin Deserts, the Sierra Nevada Cascade Ranges. Those are places where we ended up, those latter uh, regions I mentioned, are places where we ended up with public lands. But our sense in the 19th and early 20th centuries of the future of the Great Plains was to privatize that country um, and attempt to convert it into ranches and farms with no real effort to try to create something like a great game park that would have preserved animals like bison uh, and wolves uh, and grizzlies, which of course were originally Great Plains animals, primarily because of the presence of bison there, uh, in the kind of same form that happened in, uh, in a country like Kenya and East Africa, for instance. And so I think part of the, the story of bison is what seems to me to be, and, I, and not just me, many, of other, many other people, uh, of correcting the historical error that we made. And so here we are a century later trying to figure out how to get bison wild on places like the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana, on the Charles Russell a wildlife refuge there, uh, how to assist an organization like American Prairie in Montana in realizing this dream that we didn't get a century ago. So we have all these animals wild again, not across the entire Great Plains, obviously. We're going to leave most of the Great Plains uh, private property in the form of ranches and farms, but uh, we'd like to have some small part of it, still preserve this grand bestiary that native people preserved for us for 10,000 years after the end of the Pleistocene and that old world worlders inherited when we got here and yet ended up destroying. So, I mean, I'm taking a kind of a long view about this, obviously, uh, and when you take the short view, clearly you're confronting all kinds of issues and, and uh uh, differences of opinion about this because there are plenty of people who don't like the idea uh, of some sort of game park that includes wild bison on the Great Plains. But the long view, it seems to me, argues for, for this kind of trajectory in the 21st century. And in the, the books I've done, including uh, 
the new one that uh, uh, is coming out this fall, uh, Wild New World. I mean, I essentially argue that what we have a chance to do in the 21st century is sort of analogous to the creation of the first world's great national parks in the 19th century, the creation of the, the world's first great wilderness system in the 20th century, and now in the 21st century, we have a chance to look back at our history and sort of address what seems to have been a mistake and try to, uh, to turn things right. And so that's, uh, that's, how I, that's kind of a long-winded way of how I look at it. Okay, great question. Great answer, and I was thinking of the poppers and their buffalo commons as you were talking, and considering that we're sitting in North Dakota, there weren't a lot of people in favor of turning all the Great Plains into a buffalo commons again, but the idea, I think, uh, and we'll have more conversation this afternoon probably about that, is what's happening in Montana with the, um, with the um, what's that initiative called? where they're buying up land and creating that American Prairies. American Prairies. Too simple for this mind to remember. So, okay, do we have another question? We have another question up here. Yes, uh, I'm Les Thomas from the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. Uh, you mentioned down here about a religion, but uh, as uh, Mr. John Eagle mentioned, everything has a spirit, even a rock. So what's your take on between the spirituality of the wild buffalo having a wild spirit compared to this religion? Uh, well, not being uh, native, that's a, not an easy question for me to answer. Um, um, I'm obviously coming from outside uh, the, the native experience. Um, as a native Louisianian, I'm even coming from outside the, the experience of the West, but uh, I've been in the West long enough, I think, to absorb some of that. Uh, and as for the native experience, I'm just uh, an, an admirer uh, uh, and an outside observer who uh, relies on what I think are the, the best explanations for uh, how native people have looked at the buffalo uh, through uh, a religious or uh, spiritual connection, which as I emphasized uh, in the talk here, and uh, I've also done the same in, in uh, my books, uh, I see as uh, one of a recognition of kinship. And as I said, I think, uh, and this is largely from having spent most of the pandemic working on this uh, this. Uh, newest book of mine. Uh, I think this is actually a, a really pretty old human insight that Native people preserved in all the different forms of their various uh, religious and spiritual traditions. Uh, and there were, of course, many different forms of that. But it's a, a key insight that seemed to be common in all the, all the Native religions that I looked at when I was working on this book that uh, you find evidence of going far back in, in human history. And uh, uh, for example, the, uh, the, the art of Chauvet Cave, 35,000 years old in uh, Western France, uh, preserves among uh, marvelously rendered animals of all kinds of the, basically the Pleistocene world of Europe what's known, what anthropologists at least call a therianthrope, which is uh, the representation of a woman, a human woman, who as you circle, it's, it's on a pinnacle inside the cave, as you circle this particular image, the woman, the human, morphs into a bison, and the bison, as you circle uh, the column, morphs back into a human. And so it's that this ancient idea that we have, uh, that we're all part of this same stream of life on earth, that we have a kinship, that we can understand one another through this kinship. And as, uh, as I uh, implied in the talk I did, uh, and I certainly write more about uh, in this, uh, this newest book, uh, 
this is a, a an insight that the Western world seemed to um, seem to lose over the last several thousand years. And as I said, uh, Western science only rediscovers it with the work of Charles Darwin. Uh, so that I think is that sense of kinship, uh, religious, spiritual, call it what you will, a way of identifying with other animals so that you have a a fuller understanding of both humans and them because we're all so similar and we're all kin to one another is the great, to me, the great insight uh, that native religions bring to, uh, to this whole story. And I think the task, again, in the 21st century is for the rest of us who, coming out of old world tradition, seem to have lost that to try to reacquire it, however way we do, through a respect for Native traditions or a respect for Darwinian uh, evolution or however we do so, this is a key to me to, to get back to something that will allow us to respect the world in a way we don't seem to have done for several hundred years. Uh, as I said in the talk, the, that insight amounts to they are us and we are them. And that's something that Native people understood uh, in a profound way. Thank you very much. Good question. Great answer. Do we have any other questions? Pardon me? Okay, we may lose the connection. Well, um, okay, Dr. Flores, thank you so very, very much for taking time from New Mexico. Um, I think I had shared with you that Charlotte and I spend our winters in New Mexico, and it's a, it's a beautiful land. We like it down there. We love North Dakota for all you North Dakotans, but you can have your winters, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Dr. Flores, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate your presentation and, and your responses to these questions. And what is the book that you're, uh, you've alluded to a number of times? What's your working title to that? It's, uh, it's, uh, the book comes out uh, in October uh, from uh, uh, New York publisher W.W. W. Norton, and it's called Wild New World the epic story of animals and people in America. Wow. Okay. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Please uh, thank Dr. Flores for being with us today. <laughs>